hi everyone, uh, people that are here. Thanks for coming. And also in Zoom, I see some familiar names. Hi to everyone and uh, some unfamiliar names. But at the end of this lecture, I guess we will start to get familiar. And uh, let's put the title of the course. A crash course in knot theory, which sounds a bit scary, but I named the lecture in this way because I want to give like kind of every kind of aspect in knot theory, but mostly combinatorial approach. We will just uh, follow. Uh, I'm Nesle Hongimju. So uh, I'm an assistant professor in uh, Izmir Institute of Technology. So Izmir is a city in the west coast of Turkey. I'm from there also. So after going around the globe, uh, for postdoc positions and for PhD, etc. I got back to my home city and uh, I worked uh, with Sofia Lambrupulu and uh, Louis Kaufman uh, during my PhD. Uh, now I'm collaborating with many people in the world uh, that I, I don't want to list the names now. So uh, I think it's good to start by just giving some background information for knot theory. How uh, did it start? Is it theory or non theory? I mean, knots are our usual uh, objects that we use like in our regular lives, in routine life uh, times, like in our shoes or whatever, I mean, in our uh, dressings. And, uh, but I think it was considered to be like a serious topic at the end of 19th uh, century uh, by the theory of uh, Lord Kelvin. So let's start to write some dates. So. I mean, approaching to the end of 19th century, in between these years, there was a theory called vortex atom theory, which was proposed by Lord Kelvin, or William Thompson, all right, uh, the regular name, let's say. Uh, and uh, he proposed that every atom, every particle is kind of a vortex uh, in a matter or a substance called ether. So every atom is kind of uh, having some geometrical configuration uh, and the universe is filled with this matter and uh, they are just, you know, uh, forming vortices, uh, atoms. So with this uh, theory that was refuted later, I mean, in a very short time, actually, I mean, it was believed to be so just uh, for 20 years or so. Uh, but after this proposal, uh, his PhD student, uh, Tate, started to make a tabulation of nodes. So it means that he just sat down and he started to make a list of nodes, which nodes are uh, different from each other. And he, uh, at the time, I mean, there was no algebraic topological uh, tool or function to separate uh, two knots from each other, but uh, it was more like intuitive uh, tabulation, but it was correct up to a point. He made the tabulation up to 10 crossings. You can find it online. It's not tabulation if you just Google it. And then, yeah, I mean, uh, this was happening at the end of 19th century. Then um, there were so many other physical uh, theories. And then in the 20th century, Einstein came. So, as I said, I mean, this was uh, reputed to be wrong. This theory, it wasn't, I mean, a valid theory in the end. But uh, the interest in knots, have, uh, it has started with this proposal of this theory, I can say. Then, of course, I mean, 20th century came. And, of course, Poincaré came, right? I mean, Poincaré gave lots of algebraic topological uh, tool for us to study manifolds, uh, study topological spaces. And of course, one of them was a fundamental group. I mean, uh, in that year, years, uh, Titze started to think about the fundamental group of a knot complement. in our tree. 
uh, but uh, they were using some um, homotopy uh, tools and uh, you know it was purely algebraic topological also at that time Titze realized that there can be some kind of planar representation of the fundamental group of a, a not complement I will talk about that if time permits today and then of course I mean uh, in the beginning of 20th century I can say that up to like uh, till the end of the first quarter, Rydomizers uh, and Alexander's works uh, really contributed to the theory. I mean, uh, after 20th century, after the um, first quarter of uh, 20th century, not theory was considered to be a theory itself. So it wasn't just a, you know, a fantastical uh, theory in physics or kind of, you know, esoterical uh, shapes, but uh, with the improvements in algebraic topology in the beginning of the 20th century and with the contributions uh, of uh, Rydermeister and Alexander, it started to get uh, to be a theory. And after that, there were so many improvements in not theory and we still study it. And it has uh, found many applications in understanding DNA topology and protein folding and any kind of uh, string or kind of chain or linear structure in our body kind of uh, tends to uh, get folded because I mean there is a metaphor that I can just give now if you just put your earphones in your pockets which is a compact space right it starts to get nodded so in uh, our cells proteins are kind of behaving the same or in nature many other uh, structures living structures so okay this is the history part and let's get started with the definitions uh, I will start really preliminaries uh, right now so what is a knot so we know what a knot is in our daily life that I mean we, we tie our ropes or whatever but a knot in mathematics is a smooth embedding of the unit circle into the three-dimensional Euclidean space. Or you can replace this by S3, by adding one uh, point, infinity point, if you want to consider your space, ambient space, as compact. Uh, we want uh, our smooth embeddings to be non-singular so that uh, our function k is uh, differentiable, but uh, I mean, at any point, there is a tangent vector, so it never vanishes. So we want, I mean, we work particularly or basically with uh, non-singular closed curves in three-dimensional space. Uh, in the classical situation or case, we work with R3 or S3, or you can just generalize the theory to other three-dimensional manifolds like thickened surfaces or uh, whatever you want, maybe non-orientable surfaces. So this is the uh, definition of a knot, a smooth knot. Why we put some uh, conditions like being differentiable and being non-singular? Uh, because as I just said, we want some tangent, well-defined tangent uh, direction at any point on the knot. Otherwise, if you just uh, assume a continuity for our embeddings, I mean, if it is just a continuous embedding, then we could have some uh, pathological cases like um, wild knots that we call wild knots. So, I mean, uh, with these assumptions, we have objects that are very nicely shaped in three-dimensional space like this, or like this, or like this. These are all uh, tame knots. So, as I just emphasized uh, recently, with these assumptions, we avoid infinitely many nodding so that uh, we have a compact space as the image of S1. Uh, we will have a limit point in the continuity case. In the limit point, there could be a non-well-defined uh, tangent direction. So we, we want to avoid it. And these are nice tame knots that we work with. Um, OK, so here uh, we see some different uh, configurations here. Uh, but I say that these are knots. And they look really different, but are they really different from each other? When we work in topology, we consider our objects up to some 
uh, equivalence relation, such as homeomorphisms or uh, isotopies, homotopies. And in this case, the uh, equivalence relation that we will consider our, on our uh, not set will be called ambient isotopy. Uh, and finally, we will prove that this knot is really different than this one. And these two knots are really different than this very regular uh, knot, which is the unknot. It is just uh, it doesn't contain any nodding information in itself, right? It is just a circle identity image of the circle unit circle. So the main problem of knot theory is to just distinguish uh, given any, uh, two knots from each other, make a knot classification to understand uh, knots the set of knots up to some equivalence relation. So here, uh, I just draw a picture and I say that the middle one is the unknot, okay? or it is called the trivial knot. So how do we define that? It is the only knot that uh, spans or bounds the disk in the three-dimensional space, right? Let's make a knot here. Um, maybe uh, the only knot that bounds a disk in R3. Okay, so let's give this definition of the unknot, or I mean, uh, you can just uh, restrict this knot in the plane so that it has no intersections with itself. Uh, we can also define it in that way, or we I mean, there are some various uh, other definitions for the unknot, but you can just assume this right now. Any questions? Okay, so I need to draw some other figures, but I'm just erasing this part. Of course, we can just extend our domain to contain more circles, right? I mean, if you uh, assume the domain is uh, consisting of some disjoint union of a number of circles, then in the image we will have disjoint union of knots. All right, and uh, these are these objects will be called links. So let's write the definition. A link in R three is a disjoint union of knots. So every knot is a link with one component. We can say in summary, and uh, some examples of links. For example, we have this very famous, well-known link that is called hop link. So it has two components. In the three-dimensional space, these two components are not intersecting. And we may have some on link with two components. Or we may have the whitehead link. Let's use some other color for the other component. So the purple component goes all over the front strands. So you see these uh, links that I just gave as, a, as samples of uh, this definition, uh, they contain two components, right? I mean, up to homeomorphism, they are equivalent to each other. But up, up to the not equivalence that I will just define, are they equivalent to each other? I mean, is there a way to just take apart these two components from each other so that hoplink turns into unlink? Or is there a way to take apart this purple component out of this clasped uh, component so that we can resolve these crossings here by some uh, deformation and then it gets trivial link as well with two components. So these are uh, like very quick questions to ask, right? I mean, we really understand the question here. It's very intuitive. Okay, there are some not some config geometrical co uh, configurations up to some topological relation. Are they the same or not? So that's the main problem of, of not theory, I can say. Given two knots, K1 and K2, are they related to each other? 
That's the question. Or as a top uh, question, uh, we can ask, given a link or a not, can we trivialize it? Can we just uh, unresolve? Uh, we, can we just resolve this uh, knot to be the trivial knot, for example? So, I mean, for uh, studying these questions, uh, the main problems of knot theory, uh, we need to define what we mean the uh, what we mean here by equivalence relation. So, let me give the definition of ambient isotopy. So, let's have two knots. Not in not three. Okay. And then being the isotopy. Of R3. Uh, taking. K1. K2. Is a function. From R3 times. The unity interval to. R3 itself, such that we want this function to be a diffeomorphism at every time instance. You can consider this uh, component of the domain or the Cartesian product as the time interval so that I will rewrite the function as a function depending on time and here is the domain coming from the three-dimensional space, we want this function to be a diffeomorphism of the three-dimensional space. Uh, okay. Secondly, we want at the initial time instance the identity function, that our uh, function is behaving as the identity function, Maybe I should just, yeah, I mean, okay. And lastly, at the, init at the terminal time instance, we want K1 to be sent to K2. So uh, such a function is, a, is called ambient isotopy of the whole space, which is the three-dimensional Euclidean space, taking one knot to the other one. As you see, I mean, at each time instance, we want a diffeomorphism, so it avoids uh, these passages here to break uh, each other, right? I mean, we, we, are not, we cannot just allow this underpassing strand goes over uh, to the top and passes through the overpassing strand, because it just conflicts with this diffeomorphism uh, non-intersecting uh, condition here. Uh, injectivity or in other words. Okay, and if there is such an uh, isotopy relation between two knots, taking one knot to the other one, we will assume that these two knots are the same in three-dimensional space. Okay, and uh, I will denote the sameness by this equivalence relation uh, notation because it really gives us an equivalence relation on the set of knots. So if I didn't assume uh, the domain of isotopy as R3, we could just undo any knot. I mean, suppose that you have a string with a knot. Um, maybe I should draw a picture here. Okay, this is a very basic picture. And start to pull the ends to the right and to the left. And as time goes by, you will reach the point that you lose your knot. Right. So isotopy on just the domain S1, for example, not the whole space, uh, will just uh, terminate in a trivial theory. So that's why we consider uh, continuous deformations happening or smooth def deformations happening in the three-dimensional space. We take into account the ambient space. Okay. Um, as an equivalent uh, definition, I can say that um, Two knots are considered to be equivalent if there is an orientation preserving homeomorphism of the three-dimensional space uh, to itself. Maybe I should also just write that um, here. Let's keep it as a knot. We may use it later.
So equivalent definition. Um, two nodes, or just K1, K2, let's call them. K1 is equivalent to K2 if there is an orientation preserving homeomorphism, H, let's call it, of our tree to itself, taking one knot to the other one. Okay? So we can use both definitions because in the end, if we have such an uh, uh, orientation preserving homeomorphism, taking one knot to the other one, any orientation preserving homeomorphism is isotopic to the identity map, so it results in them being the isotopy, actually. Uh, this assumption, uh, the existence of such homeomorphism. Okay, so here are some examples of equivalent knots, very simple ones. I mean, suppose that we have such a knot in three-dimensional space. I mean, you can just imagine that we can undo this knot uh, without conflicting uh, the decay morphism condition here, right? I mean, as time goes by, I mean, we can just turn this, uh, twist this part and turn it uh, to the trivial knot. It's easy to see. And I mean, there can be some more weird stuff like this. Oops. Something like this. They are all equivalent uh, up to these definitions. They are all unknots. So we allow uh, smooth deformations uh, of links in three-dimensional space to consider them as, you know, our objects. Okay, so I should make a remark here also. Uh, so we define a knot in three-dimensional space. I mean, the image of uh, the unit circle is, um, uh, it is considered to be in the three-dimensional space. You could ask me, what if we consider the uh, ranges the four-dimensional Euclidean space, and it, any knot will be trivial, right? We would have some space to undo any knot. Um, and it is, I mean, it can be proven easily by using some general positioning arguments uh, that are used in, uh, in the proof of Whitney embedding theorem, etc. Okay. So if you don't have any questions, I will go to the projections of uh, knots. So up to now, we define our knots in three-dimensional space, uh, preferably uh, in the three-dimensional Euclidean space. And now I will project uh, a given knot in three-dimensional space to a plane, to a chosen plane. And uh, maybe I should just draw here. And the pictures will be looking alike, these pictures, since I'm drawing any knot in the two-dimensional uh, space right now. So consider, um, again, this knot living in three-dimensional space. And I take its projection to the xy plane. So the projection will be actually an immersed curve, immersed Uh, closed curve, right? Or you can consider it as a for uh, regular graph, right? I mean, any kind of passage here or weaving information is just uh, transferred into a self-intersection here in the projection. So you could also consider a knot projection as a four-valent or four-regular planar graph, right? whatever you want to work with. I mean, if you want to do some topology, maybe as an immersed curve, but if you want to pass to the language of uh, graph theory, you can consider the projections as regular planar graphs so that it gives some information about the configuration here, graphical information. Uh, but, I mean, it's not just that. I mean, to be able to really understand or grasp the information happening in three-dimensional space, these four valent vertices should be considered with some information, right? So every four valent vertex 
that appears in the projection of a knot will be considered either like this or like this. Okay? So, of course, I mean, it's not randomly chosen. It's up to the weaving information, the configuration happening in three-dimensional space. You just reflect this information. So here, this, uh, uh, this how to say that, representation means that here in the three-dimensional space, this part of the knot, this part of the strand goes uh, on top of the other one, all right? So I just represent what's going on in three-dimensional space by these break, uh, break ideas or break points. So it's more than uh, a knot diagram, is more than a four-valent graph or regular graph. It is just uh, a graph. Uh, at each vertex, there is a crossing information, or you can say that a knot diagram, let's define it here, Definition, a knot diagram is an immersed closed curve in R3, uh, R2, sorry. Right? I mean, we can define with, with a crossing information at each. Uh, self intersection or double point. So here, of course, you can also really ask inside of, uh, I mean, these are very regular uh, projections, right? I mean, uh, there can be some directions of projections that can result in some nasty diagrams, like nasty projections. What I mean is, I mean, here we have some projections that are transversal, that have transversal uh, self-intersections or double points, right? It means that at each vertex, I can just endow uh, two tangent vectors to span the tangent, uh, two tangent vectors to span the tangent uh, space of the plane, right? So I have some two-dimensional uh, space span spanned by these uh, tangent vectors. So what could happen, uh, for example, we just, could have things like this in the projection, some tangency uh, intersections, so that at this point there will be just one tangent vector. We don't want this. Or there could be multiple uh, intersections, right? So there could be uh, observed some vertices of higher degree. So we don't want this, not a lot. And we can always perturb uh, the uh, projection or our knot or our direction of the projection so that we have some nice projections that we will call knot diagrams, all right? So in a knot diagram, there will be always, a, uh, there will be always transversal double points. Okay. Or we don't also allow cusps like this, corners. Okay, so let's make an observation, a fast one, because I will use it in the uh, future lectures, let's say. So I just say that we can consider the projected uh, curve, I mean the, the curve that lies in the projection, uh, as a four-valent, uh, four-regular planar graph. So this means that we can make use of the Euler's formula here, all right? Uh, so... What can we say? We have, for example, here three four-valent vertices and they connect some edges to each other, right? So at each vertex, what we observe is there are four adjacent edges that are shared by two uh, vertices, actually. I mean, they are connected to some other vertices, right? Each edge is shared by two vertices. So this means that a knot diagram a fast observation, a knot diagram with n crossings or a knot graph with n vertices divides the plane into n plus two regions. 
or faces in graph theoretical uh, terminology. This comes from, I mean, this is resulted by the Euler's formula because we have n vertices, two n edges, and there is a number of faces here. It should be equal to two since we are working in the sphere, two sphere or in the plane. All right. So this results f is equal to n plus two. Okay, very essential observation here, but it's nice to make it uh, make this observation right now. Of course, we can just extend this uh, observation if a knot diagram is uh, embedded in a higher genus surface because there is a generalization of the Euler's formula. Okay. So, uh, maybe I should also say, I mean, I will be using, I will be saying that this is an overpassing strand, okay? Overpassing. And this is an underpassing strand. And this uh, vertex with an extra information here is called a crossing, okay? Crossing of a knot diagram. Okay. Uh, we can also assume some orientation, some direction on knot diagrams. Uh, so it is just basically, you can, if you consider this as knot diagrams, you can just direct the strand either counterclockwise or clockwise, right? Uh, so we can endow our knot diagrams with some orientation. We can consider our equivalence moves up to the orientation, given orientation. But, okay, so we passed the... Uh, combinatorial approach right now. I mean, we were in three-dimensional space and we started to project our knots uh, into some plane and we defined some equivalence relation in three-dimensional space that was called ambient isotopy or orientation preserving homeomorphisms uh, induce equivalence relation in three-dimensional space. What happens in the plane or in the uh, two sphere? I mean, how can we grasp this deformations in these combinatorial pictures or on these combinatorial pictures. So, in again, very early in 20th century, Ryder Messer proved that there's, there's just three moves that generate the ambient isotopy in three-dimensional space. And these are combinatorial moves that are happening in the plane. They are planar moves. So, maybe I just erase the definition. Make a title, Ryder Meister moves. So, first I define or I give you the set of moves, these combinatorial moves, and I will uh, present the statement of Ryder Meister that really uh, help us to work uh, not theory in a combinatorial way. So, these are three moves. The first one, okay, maybe four of them I will just picture. Uh, the first one, if you just have a strand, a piece of strand, it's a local picture, okay, of a knot diagram, you can just deform it in this way, right? I mean, it's planar homotopy or planar isotopy. Okay, this is considered to be the Rydermeister zero move. I mean, this is not actually a very important move comparing to the other ones. So the first Rydermeister move, that gets more complicated. If we have a piece of strand, you can just add a kink to it in this way, right? So this is the first Rydermeister move. And it is not a planar isotopy anymore because isotopy just do not allow uh, self-intersections of the curve in the two-dimensional space, sphere or plane, whatever. So it is something combinatorial here. We just assume it in the plane. I mean, we just assume that we can add a crossing or delete a crossing. This is two ways, all right? Uh, to a piece of uh, strand of the knot diagram. And the second move, if you consider a configuration like this, so here what's happening is one strand is going all over the other one, right? You can just take apart these two strands from each other, okay? Or, I mean, in the uh, opposite direction, if you have this 
uh, two trivial strands, right? Not touching or uh, not interact interacting with each other. You can just pull one of them uh, or under or over uh, the other one, right? So this is called the second randomizer move, okay? And the third one is containing a triangular configuration. So we have these two piece of strands here. One is going all uh, over the other one. And there is a third one going all under the uh, two of them, all right? So you can just pull this strand across the crossing here. Like this. And this is called the third Rydomizer move. So, as I said, I mean, these are combinatorial moves, which means that these are moves that are changing the graphical structure of the projection, right? Or, or the not graph. Here we add a vertex, for example, or we here delete or add a vertex, or here uh, the vertices are changing its position with respect to another third uh, vertex. So, these are all uh, planar moves. But when you consider these moves uh, happening in three-dimensional space, it is easy to understand that these are really like giving us some deformations, right? I mean, they are, uh, I mean, they are, they can be generators of MB and isotopy uh, relation. I mean, in three-dimensional space, untwisting this part of the knot is nothing, right? I mean, it doesn't really uh, conflict with diffeomorphism assumption in the equivalence relation definition or here we can we have the configuration in three-dimensional space one piece of the rope or strand is going all under the other one so you can just take them apart or here it's not even touching they are not intersecting in uh, three-dimensional three space so you can just pull this third strand uh, underneath uh, the third crossing here right so when you imagine these moves in three-dimensional space all right you understand that uh, these are corresponding to some uh, acceptable deformations. But then Reidemeister uh, gave a statement that tells more to us. He just proved with his theorem that these are the only moves that generate the whole continuous or smooth deformations in three-dimensional space that we consider for not, uh, not lying in three-dimensional space. So let's write the theorem here. Maybe another color. So this is the theorem of Rydomeister, and it was, I guess, given by given in 1926 or 8. To be sure, I will write 8, but I mean, uh, during that uh, period from 1925 to 28. I may uh, misremember it, sorry for that. So it says that. Two knot diagrams K1 and K2 in a plane, they can be in separate planes, all right? These are pictures. When I say knot uh, diagram, I don't assume a plane for it. I mean, I'm just thinking of my knot diagrams regardless of which plane they are projected in. It doesn't matter if it is XY plane or YZ or XZ, whatever. So two knot diagrams, K1 and K2 in a plane, uh, represent the same knot in three-dimensional space if and only if K1 is related to K2 by a finite sequence of Rydomeister moves. I don't believe that he called his own moves as Rydomeister moves, but it's something happening in mathematics, right? Somebody then named the moves or a polynomial, a polynomial in the name of Hilbert or some space in the name of Hilbert. I don't think Hilbert was naming his space as Hilbert space, but here is the same case. So. Uh, the theorem says that uh, if we have two knot pictures or knot diagrams, 
they are representing the same knot in three-dimensional space if we can transform one knot diagram to another one by using these moves, all right? Uh, either one or two or a sequence, a finite sequence of these moves. So as I said, I mean, the proof of uh, this theorem, uh, the if part is trivial. Because if we know that there is a transformation of one diagram to the other one by using these moves, it's really straightforward to think that these are corresponding, these moves are corresponding to ambient isotopy deformations in three-dimensional space. The only part uh, is harder to prove. prove. Uh, so for the only part, we make a use of some induction argument. So first of all, we assume some uh, triangulation argument on our smooth knots. So we consider consider a knot as a polygonal knot. Okay, so we start with this uh, consideration. We have smooth. Uh, we are working in smooth category, so we can consider our knot diagrams or knots by a, uh, I mean, formed up by a finite number of uh, line segments, all right? So any smooth uh, manifold admits a triangulation. So it's, it's a result, I mean, this consideration is a, this assumption is a result of this uh, theorem. So we consider a knot in three-dimensional space, not a knot diagram, first of all, uh, is a polygonal or piecewise linear knot, okay? So, and we consider delta moves on polygonal knots. So these are moves that eliminates a triangular region. So here, if we have the structure, all right, some line segments here forming our knot, okay? This is again a local representation of a complete knot. And what happens here is that we can just send these two line segments to one line segment here, okay? Or conversely, in the opposite direction, if we have this line segment, we can just uh, break it into two line segments to uh, form this triangular region. So this is called a delta move. And Rydermeister's uh, argument just started with this assumption, like he considers not this polygonal and he considers uh, the smooth deformations of three-dimensional space uh, are uh, induced by these moves, all right? So these delta moves are defined in three-dimensional space for polygonal knots. Then he starts to uh, look at the configurations of the delta move triangular regions. So it means that, I mean, in this picture, in the triangular region that we just eliminate or add to the strand, it doesn't, I mean, there's, we don't observe any strands, right, passing through. But uh, in some projection or in some other region, there could be some strands passing underneath or overneath, whatever, or more than that, right? I mean, there can be like a thousand strands passing through this triangular region, maybe. So here the inductive argument starts on the projection of such uh, triangular regions and triangular regions that are used in delta moves. Okay, so this is the first step. And the second step uh, is utilizing an induction argument on the number of strands in triangular regions. So I will give a picture here. So for example, um, as I said, I mean, it could, it could be this case, right? There is no strand going under or over, like interacting with this triangular region. So the projection doesn't contain any strands, like, so we see this picture basically. So this is corresponding to the zero move, right? It's a uh, planar isotopy in the projection. But it could be something like this. 
I assume that the number of strands interacting with the triangular, mo uh, triangular region is one, okay? So we could have this configuration, for example, in the case when n is equal to one. So in this case, the triangular move just eliminates the triangle here, and we have this, right? So this corresponds to Rademeister 1, easy to see. There could be something else in n is equal to 1 case. It could be this configuration in the projection. Then the delta move is projected like this. So this is corresponding or giving us Rademeister 2. Or you could increase the number of strands interacting with the region, triangular region to two, and you will see that you will obtain Rademeister uh, three in that case, okay? I don't draw that. So you see, I mean, in the basic steps of the induction argument, you see the moves really, the Rademeister moves. Then Rademeister says that if you have a finite number of, any finite number of strands in the triangular region, then uh, the one, uh, one data move is just induced by a sequence of these uh, three moves. And you need to do some subdivision as well. So you could have something like this. I mean, there could be many strands passing through this uh, region, let's say. So first you start by adding some vertices here. So you subdivide the edges and then you apply a triangular move here. So it is corresponding to one Rademeister two, for example. Then you continue like this. So with subdivision of uh, edges that forms our knot diagram in the projection, and with these moves, you can really grasp all the formation uh, idea happening in three-dimensional space. Any questions? Maybe you could, do, uh, you could take it as an exercise if you just uh, allow five strands passing through, this, uh, passing through the projection of the triangular region, which moves you need to use. So the important point is to see that you just need to use zero, one, two, or three move. So these are the generators of the ambient isotopy in the plane. These are moves in the plane. So I, I say that um, just recently, we can assume our knot diagrams as oriented or directed, all right? So there, uh, there is uh, oriented versions of Rademeister moves as well. So I need to maybe write it. Maybe here. Okay, so in the oriented case, for example, uh, you may have a strand oriented in this way. So you can have this, right, with right of ICR1, or you can have this, okay? And there is this opposite direction, uh, opposite directed version of this move as well, right? I don't draw that. Or in the second move case, we may have this configuration that these two strands are directed oppositely, for example, and we apply one Rademeister two move to obtain this uh, configuration here. So, I mean, in total, uh, for Rademeister one, there are two types of oriented versions of uh, Rademeister moves, all right? So, in the second uh, move, th there is also four types, okay? I leave this as an exercise to you to see that we can only have four types of oriented Rademeister 2. And in the third Rademeister move case, we have eight possibilities. This is one of the possibilities. According to the directions on the strands uh, that take place in the move. Okay. Oriented. But then, 
I mean, it's it's a big uh, list, right? I mean, we have four types of Rydomyster one, uh, four uh, for Rydomyster two, and uh, eight for Rydomyster three. So in total, it's sixteen moves. Uh, we can reduce this uh, list of moves. Actually, Polyak. Recording stopped. Gave a list of uh, moves. Should I continue or? Yeah, recording is stopped. Okay, so Polyak says that uh, oriented Rydermeister moves are generated by uh, two types of two types of recording in progress. Rydermeister one moves. Okay. And two types of maybe here two types of Rydermeister two and it is one. You exchange the directions. And you need just one uh, oriented Rydermeister 3 move, which is this, okay? I don't add this here because of the space. So Polyak just uh, made, gave us a generator list, generating list of the oriented Rydermeister moves. So uh, if you want to check two diagrams are equivalent to each other or not, or they represent the same knot or not, and if they admit some orientation, we just need to check if they are transformed to each other by these uh, four moves, okay, four oriented moves. One type of, two types of Rydermeister 1, two types of Rydermeister 2, and one type of Rydermeister 3 move. In the beginning of the course, I just told you that the main problem of knot theory is to distinguish two knots from each other, right? Given a knot, we want to be able to say uh, if this knot is equivalent to, for example, to the trivial knot, okay, or to some other knot. What's the intrinsic information that we can take from this knot? We, in this picture, we see there are three interactions of the strands with each other, right? So if you consider this as a uh, graph, there will, I mean, we can say that there are three vertices. If you say that it's a knot diagram, uh, it has three crossings in this representation. But we consider this representation or this knot up to some relation, right? That is given by three Rydermeister moves plus the planar isotopy. So the question now is that is there a finite sequence of Rydermeister moves that will take this knot to this one? Of course, again, I mean, it's easy to ask this question, right? I mean, you can all understand, okay, we understand the problem. But it's not that trivial to see this by direct attack. Like, I mean, okay, let me try to untie or undo this knot. It's like an interesting puzzle, but uh, in terms, I mean, for me, ma making a meaningful theory, we need some uh, useful tools that we call knot invariants that will preserve the intrinsic information of the knot. In other words, that will be preserved, the value will be preserved under the equivalence relation that we assume for our knots. So, uh, one of these uh, invariants, or maybe I just define a knot invariant in the beginning, a knot invariant is a function, let me call it i, okay, defined on the set of knots. And the value set is some mathematical set, m. And we want this uh, mappings to satisfy this property. If we have two equivalent knots or two related knot diagrams, okay, as representations, then we want the value under this function or mapping to be the same, okay? 
So this, this is the general scheme of a knot invariant. It's a function on the set of knots, right? I mean, if you consider not as equivalent classes, then I mean, we, we have a well-defined mapping here with this definition. So a mathematical set, which can be integers or uh, some polynomial ring, whatever. Okay, you can change it. It may be a group, and uh, we will see some examples right now. But I want to start with a very basic knot uh, invariant that is called the crossing uh, number. So it is defined for a knot diagram, this map. So the crossing number of this representation of the trefoil knot is three, right? I mean, you can see that in this picture, we have three crossings. But the question is, can we reduce the number of crossings in some other representation of the same knot, right? And how to extract an invariant, a function, out of this number? So in one representation, it can be three or In some other representation, let me just go from the beginning, it can be four, right? I mean, you can just add one crossing or more crossings, right? These are equivalent knots in three dimensional space or equivalent representations. They are related by Rydermeister one move, for example, right? So in this case, this representation has a, a more crossings than this one, right? So to take uh, or to extract an invariant out of this number that we observe on knot representations or knot diagrams, we take the minimum number of crossings that we can observe for a knot representation, okay? So definition, the crossing number of a knot is the minimum number number of crossings that uh, the knot admits in its representations, in its diagrams. So when you consider uh, this number as the minimum number of crossings or minimum some minimal number, as a minimal number, you uh, get a not invariant. It doesn't change with respect to the representation, right? The minimum number of crossings. So in one representation, as I just uh, repeat myself, you may have, I mean, the diagram, uh, the crossing number of a diagram may change, right? I mean, in this diagram, it is three. In this diagram of the trefoil knot in, of the same knot, it is four, but the minimum here is three, right? Now the question is, can we reduce it to two, for example, or even one or to zero, right? So I should say here that maybe as a note and as an exercise, any knot diagram with uh, two or less crossings represent the unknot, okay? So this is an easy exercise to see. I mean, you can just take it as a homework. So, I mean, if we have the information that this knot is not the unknot, we would know that it should have at least three crossings, right? But the question now reduces to if the trefoil knot is really unknotted or non-trivial. We don't know that. By looking at the picture, we can't uh, decide about that. So we will have some uh, stronger uh, invariants to be able to say that we can't reduce the number of crossings uh, less than three, okay? It should be really like the minimum representation, the minimum representation of the trefoil knot has crossing number three. It can't be two because otherwise, if it was two or one, it would be unknot, but how do we know that this is not the unknot? Okay. All right. So here, there is an uh, open problem, a long-standing pr 
problem uh, about the crossing number is you see it's a rough uh, invariant right i mean it is hard to understand or it's hard to compute it right i mean if you have like a complicated knot how do you know, know that you can do some reductions and how do you know that you really uh, obtain the minimum number of crossings for the knot representation um, so the long-standing problem says that first of all i need to define an operation, a binary operation on the set of knots. Uh, so if you have two knots, I will just represent knots in a box, okay? And the remaining part is a trivial strand like this. So everything is just captured in a box. Yeah. And suppose that we have the second knot here, okay? So we can define a connected sum operation on these two diagrams, which is just connecting these two knots in this way, okay? So it is basically deleting a trivial part of the strand from each uh, representation of these diagrams, uh, representations, and then you splice them together without creating a crossing, okay? So, So you see, I mean, in the end, we have a composite knot. These, if these are like uh, some uh, components or prime knots, we can, I mean, if you, you consider these knot, uh, uh, knots as like prime components of some uh, set, then in the end, you have a composite object here after this operation. So connected so on knots is defined and if you consider the set of knots with this operation it gives us a commutative monoid okay you can prove that uh, this operation is associative and it has an identity i mean it is very clear that if you take the second knot as the identity or the trivial knot it is the identity element uh, and then you should be also uh, you should be able to prove that uh, the only knot that is an inverse uh, with respect to the connected sum operation is the trivial knot. So no other knot, no, uh, no non-trivial knot has an inverse up to this operation. So this operation doesn't give us a group structure, but we have a monoid. You can also uh, isotope this knot. For example, you can just pull this uh, K2 box along uh, to the left of K1 so that uh, you have an abelian structure here, right? K1 plus K2 is equal to K2 plus K1. It's easy to see. Uh, from this picture, these properties. Also, associativity can be proven uh, using these diagrams. Okay. All right, so the long-standing problem about the crossing number, which is very easy to define, but hard to uh, determine, let's say. And the problem says that if you have two knots, The crossing number is additive. It means that the connected sum of uh, the co crossing number of connected sum of these two knots is equal to the sum of the crossing numbers of uh, each knot. So this is not uh, solved yet. You see, the statement is really clear again, and it is easy to see that. Uh, so out of these two knots, you obtain a third knot. And it has also always this possibility that the crossing number is less than or equal to this sum. Okay. So it is easy to see. You obtain the structure, and then you may have more moves to reduce the number of crossings here. But the opposite direction is not no, okay? 
So there are some uh, bounds or estimations for the crossing number. For example, I should write a research result by Mark Leckenby. So it says that there is a constant and greater than one such that one over n times crossing number of the first one plus crossing number of the second one is less than or equal to the crossing number of the connected sum. So if we can reduce this constant to one, the problem is solved. But we know the existence, a, a non-trivial existence, and the existence of a non-trivial constant here. You can find the paper, you can Google it again and check how is it done. And there, there are some algorithmic uh, approaches going on here. We know this uh, problem's answer is positive. Like, I mean, it is really like true that this equality holds for some specific knots. For example, um, I write it here. This is a result of, should I use this? Maybe I just erase this and I write the theorem here. This is a result of Kaufman Murasugi and Tisselweight. Oh, sorry, not H. So it says that if we have alternating knots, here alternating means that uh, they admit a representation, a projection or a diagram whose uh, crossing sequence goes is alternating like under over under over or over under over under okay so suppose that we have two knots that are alternating then we have the equality but uh, I mean the problem is unknown still open for uh, many other types like torus knots or non alternating knots Maybe I should also make a picture for alternating knots. So you need to have a sequence of crossings, for example, like this, under, then it goes over, then again under, then over, etc. Okay, so this is an alternating picture, right? No, I yes, under, over, under, over, or vice versa, over, under, over, under. We also know that something nice about alternating knots, if we have an alternating and reduced diagram of a knot, then the crossing number admitted by the diagram is minimum. So I should also write that. Maybe here. Another theorem here, again by Kaufman and Tissled Weight. Uh, if K is a reduced uh, alternating knot diagram. then it contains the minimum number of crossings. Minimum number of crossings for the knot it represents. 
In other words, it's a minimal representation. It's a minimal diagram, okay? If you know that your diagram that you are working with alter is alternating and it is if it is reduced, it means that there are no removable crossings like this. So suppose that we have some nothingness going on here, okay? So, I mean, I'm just drawing an abstract knot diagram here and this crossing is adjacent to uh, four local regions, but two of them are the same, right? So if you remove this crossing in this way, your diagram becomes split. It is splitted. All right. So you can define a removable, a removable crossing as like uh, one of the splittings or uh, smoothings of that crossing results in a split diagram. Okay. It separates the connected uh, universe of the diagram into two. Or uh, you can say that you can just remove it by a giant or global Rademeister one move, right? So you get rid of uh, these kind of uh, crossings in your representation, in your diagram, it becomes reduced. And if it is alternating to, you know that crossing number uh, is attained in that diagram, crossing number of the knot. So for example, for the trefoil case, what do we know? If you start, if you choose a base point and the direction, to uh, make a route uh, along the knot, you come across with this crossing first and it goes, you're, uh, you are over the, you are on the overpassing strand, right? So the crossing sequence, if you start from here, is over, under, and then over, okay? So this is an alternating uh, representation of the trefoil knot. And it is reduced, there is no removable crossings, so you can immediately say by this theorem that uh, the minimum number of crossings that a trefoil knot has, uh, that a trefoil knot can contain, is admitted in this representation. Okay, it is three. It can't be two, for example. And this theorem was proven by using a Kaufman bracket, proved by the Kaufman bracket. which I will uh, talk about tomorrow. Tomorrow's lecture will be about Kaufman bracket. And actually this was conjectured uh, by Tate in the end of 19th century. So I said that in the end of 19th century, Tate was tabulating knots, but he didn't have any tools like algebraic topology tools. He was intuitively separating or distinguishing knots and trying to make a knot table. And he observed this, like if a, the knot diagram is alternating, he believed that it should be the minimal representation. And this was, it was proven to be true after uh, how many years? In 80s, this was proven. So after a hundred years later, it was proven to be true. So uh, his intuition was correct. But there should have been uh, some uh, high technique tools to prove this conjecture. Maybe I should also say that this is one of the conjectures of Tate. Tate's conjecture. Just to uh, credit his name. Okay. So, all right. Um, I mean, crossing number is hard to observe. I mean, if we know that a knot diagram is alternating and reduced, okay, we know uh, that it's the minimum number of crossings that a knot can obtain in that diagram. And, uh, but for example, if you check the knot tables, you will see that uh, as the crossing number increases, for example, if you go to eight crossing uh, knots, you will find some different types of knots. They are different from each other but they all have crossing number eight, for example. So it's a rough invariant, I will say. It's a coarse invariant. In crossing number three, for example, in that table, there is a unique knot. It's the trefoil. There is no other knot with crossing number three, okay? There is trefoil and its mirror image. You can reflect this diagram through uh, the vertical line and obtain the mirror image of the trefoil knot. So, there are two knots, but they are both trefoil in crossing three. And in crossing 
therefore, uh, there will be a unique knot, that is the figure eight knot. But as the number of crossings increase, you will see that there are so many types of crossings in one, um, in some number of crossings, for example, eight, nine, whatever. But uh, they all have the same crossing number. So we need to improve our uh, tools, right? I mean, the second numerical invariant that I want to define now is the linking number that is defined for links uh, that contain at least two components. linking number so uh, here I need to give an orientation on the knot diagrams or link diagrams that I'm working with okay and we may have two types of crossings according to the orientation given here. So the first one, according to the right-hand rule, is a positive crossing. It is assumed to be positive. And the second one is a negative crossing, okay? So in other words, there is a sign function here, taking a crossing to plus or minus one, okay? So the convention is this. I mean, according to right-hand rule, we determine the signs of a crossing. And the linking number is defined as the sum of signs of crossings that are shared between two components of a link. So uh, let L be an oriented link. So I will just denote an oriented link with an arrow here. Link with two components. Uh, say alpha and beta. OK. Then linking number of L is the sum of signs of crossings that are shared uh, in between alpha and beta components, okay? And I need to take the half of the sum. So an example, a quick example, let's see An oriented hop link. Okay, I give uh, directions to the components of the hop link, and then here the sign of the first crossing is plus one. Okay, and the second crossing sign is minus one. There's something wrong. Plus because. I drew it wrongly, right here. So it should be plus one as well, okay? Otherwise it would be wrong. So the linking number takes the half link to one, right? One plus one over two is one. So the linking number of the half link is one, which means that if we can prove that the linking number remains invariant under the Rydermeister moves, that these two components can't be separated from each other, right? because the linking number of this link here is zero. But I mean, to be able to say that the half link can't be transformed to the on link with two components, we need to show that the linking number is an invariant. So let's write it as a theorem. The linking number is an oriented link invariant. 
I first assume that uh, while defining the linking number uh, of a link, uh, I assume that the link is consisting of two components. But uh, we may have some links with more than two components, right? Then we can define the total linking number for such uh, links. That will be the sum of uh, the, I mean, the total sum of the signs of the shared crossings pairwisely uh, intersect in in between pairwisely intersecting uh, components. So here, I mean, the total linking number is an oriental link invariant. So to prove this theorem, we need to uh, see or verify that the linking number, uh, this integer that we assign to our links, is remaining the same under oriented Rydermeister moves, right? So I will just uh, make a quick verification here and I want you to complete the uh, proof later on, if you want. So for example, the verification for the first move, assume that we have this uh, orientation on our strand, okay? So here what we have, if you uh, have this kink or twist, uh, twisted part on a link diagram, it's happening on just one of the components of the link diagram, right? It just, I mean, some local portion of the link uh, diagram is just uh, twisting on, is just uh, adding a kink here by the move or deleting a kink, right? Uh, but it happens on just one component. So the linking number is not changing here because the linking number is defined is the sum of the signs of the crossings that are shared in between two components, okay? So there is no change here because whatever happens here is just on one component of the link. Uh, for the no change here because right on my cell one adds or deletes crossing on a unique component of the link okay? that we consider. So let's see the uh, second move. So suppose that we have this configuration before the move and after that, after the move takes place, uh, we have Two more crossings added here. So these strands might uh, belong to different components of the link, right? They are not necessarily on the same component of the link. This could be the alpha component, a part of the alpha component, and this could be the part of the beta component, for example. So what happens here? Alpha and beta interacts with each other at two crossings. But the two crossings have opposite signs, even if they are shared crossings. So they won't, the, they won't affect the total linking number in that. So let's see it clearly. So here, for example, the added crossing has positive sign and the other one is uh, having negative sign, right? So you see, when you sum up these signs, the contribution is trivial the linking number. And, I mean, the verification for the Rydermeister 3 move is left as an exercise. The Rydermeister 3 doesn't add any crossings or deletes uh, any crossings. It will change, it will permit the signs of the crossings that are uh, observed in the move triangle, let's say, but still, the total number of uh, signs won't change, even though the strands belong to different components. So you see, I mean, when uh, we want to prove that a function or a mapping defined on a knot or a knot diagram is invariant, we start to check the uh, invariance under Rydermeister moves. If there is a combinatorial definition of that function, here, the linking number could be defined in three-dimensional space as well. And the first person that uh, 
that is, who was believed to define the linking number of two curves in three-dimensional space was Gauss. So I think it was found some double integral giving the linking number of two closed curves in three-dimensional space was found uh, in some nodes of Gauss and it was just a double integral and there was no explanation about that. But at that time he was working on uh, the magnetic, the terrestrial, uh, the magnetic potential of the Earth and it is believed that he gave that formula for the number of intersections of two closed curves in three-dimensional space to understand the magnetic potential induced at an exterior point uh, by the Earth, by a magnetic uh, source. So about this, maybe I should note here a note. Uh, linking number was defined or was was defined by Carl Gauss in the 18th century I guess or in the beginning of uh, 19th century sorry about that it should be 1820 something like that so it was defined by Gauss as a double integral and you can read about this there is a very nice uh, exposition by uh, let me check the names Renzo Rica and just a second Bernardo Nipoti. The title of the paper is Gauss linking number. Number is revisited. So you can find all the historical background and how possibly Gauss derived his uh, double integral uh, in this paper. It's nicely written. Okay, so uh, you see, I mean, this is a discrete sum, but there is a three-dimensional interpretation of this invariant with some uh, integration. Uh, but this numerical invariant has also some limitations. I mean, in the end, we assign some integer. It's not a very complex structure, right? The set of integers. So for example, I will just give an example about the uh, limitations of this invariant. So let's see the whitehead link that has two components. Okay, so one component is like this and the other component is a trivial knot. Here it goes all over the white component and then underneath the white component, all right? So let's give some orientation on the whitehead link. Okay, so to be more precise, let's continue the directions and what is the linking number of this link? It looks non-trivial, right? I mean, our intuition says that we can just take apart these two components from each other and it is not trivial. It is not equivalent to the non, uh, it is not equivalent to the trivial knot with two components. I can say this, I can assure that, but the linking number take the, uh, takes this link to zero. Okay, it is the same number that uh, the unlink with two components admits actually so you can see that i mean you will just sum up the signs that are shared between the blue and the white components okay so these crossings are not uh, considered for the linking number so here is a limitation i mean it's a very basic uh, link it, it doesn't it's not uh, looking very complicated and our intuition says that we can't turn it into the trivial link, but the linking number says that it is trivial, right? 
I mean, the value is trivial. So, I mean, in the definition of uh, a knot invariant, we say that if two knots are equivalent to each other, if two knots are the same, then the values assigned to these knots should be the same under our functions. But we, it doesn't say that if the values are the same, two knots should be the same or two links. So knot theorists or we are looking for more powerful invariants that will give some deeper answer for distinguishing two knots. Okay? And linking number is unfortunately not one of them. Okay, so which I just erase. So I want to talk about now another numerical information that we can take out of a knot. Uh, it is called the right. But it is not even an invariant. It is just changing under the first Rydermeister move. So it is defined, let k be an oriental link, or L, let's say. The right of L is just the sum of the signs of every crossing. Okay. So C R L is the crossing number, uh, crossing set of L here. So we don't make a, a distinction here in between crossings shared between components or not. We just sum up. Uh, the sign of um, every crossing here to find the right of an oriented link diagram. Again, a discrete sum. So what happens here? So let's see. I mean, you will see why it's not an invariant. First, I will write it as a proposition maybe. Uh, the right of L is invariant or remains the same under Rydermeister 2 and Rydermeister 3 modes, okay? So it's not bad, but it is changing under Rydermeister 1. Let's see what happens. So suppose that we have this trivial uh, nice strand as a local picture of our link diagram and assume that we add a kink here, okay? With the Rydermeister 1 move. So here, what we have is a negative crossing, right? A negative crossing is added to the strand. So the total number of uh, the total number of the total sum of the signs of crossings is decreasing by one, right? Or we could add the other type of king like this, and then it will be a positive crossing is added, right? Then uh, before and after, the right is changing dr drastically. The right is increasing by one here. So you can't really uh, preserve the sum on the right of my one move, which is a very basic move. Uh, and it is still not bad because, I mean, there are some categories of knots, such as frame knots. These are knots uh, that are involved with some vector field along. Um, and frame knots are considered up to the regular isotopy, which is induced by just the second Rydermeister move and the third Rydermeister move. Okay? Uh, regular isotopy, we call it. Okay, so there are some uh, classes of knots that are considered up to just these two moves, okay? Because Rydermeister 1 is changing the framing on knots. So we just exclude these moves. And right becomes an invariant of regular isotopy in this case. So when you start working your knots with a framing on them, then you consider this isotopy. So it's okay uh, to work with right. 
but otherwise, uh, if you are in the classical category, uh, it's, it's not an invariant. Any questions? Maybe in the chat? No. Okay, so uh, I want to just, you know, finish today's lecture by an application of this numerical invariance, let's say. The last one is not really an invariant of classical knots and links, but uh, there is a correlation in between linking number, right, and the twisting. Uh, and this correlation happens on a very familiar object, familiar for our lives, on DNA. So let's show this correlation, I'm done. And today's lecture. An application. So um, we all know the double helix model of DNA, right? So we have basically two strands wrapping each other like this. Okay, and here. There are some nitrogen bases on these two strands, right? And they are connected by some bonds, okay? It's like a leather, a helix leather. leather. So uh, because of some biological uh, ordering here, we have the orientations on the strands like this, okay? They have opposite directions. And I will call this maybe uh, strand alpha and the other beta, okay? So, I mean, basically, we have this picture for our uh, for DNA modeling. Okay. So, what happens here? I mean, th there are so many things happening, but we can model this configuration is a link by connecting the strands to itself, to themselves, okay? So what we have is, all right, so I will just draw the picture again. So we had this uh, helix here, and I just connect the uh, tail of beta to the head of beta, okay? and I connect the endpoints of the other strand of the helix to each other, like this. So in the end, when we close this, close alpha and beta curves, in this way, we have a link. Okay, so we can uh, understand the topology of DNA or some other molecular structure uh, by using links. Uh, I mean, as we see in this picture, but how, I mean, how it behaves, the topology of DNA. Uh, DNA. So here, what we see is, um, I mean, we can consider this as a ribbon link, okay? All right, so there's a central or helical uh, axis here, right? So I will use another color. So this line is the helical or central axis of DNA, helix. So in the closed model, we have this circle here, right? As a central axis. So the right of DNA link is the number of intersections that the central, uh, central axis is making uh, within itself, okay? So in this case, there is no intersection, right? It's flat, the green central axis. There is no riding here. So the right of this uh, link is zero, or DNA. But these two strands, alpha and beta, are twisting around the green central axis, right? So this gives us the twist number of DNA. So how many twists we have, how many rotations around the uh, axis? There are two rotations, right? Full rotations. So this is the uh, twist number. I mean, it depends on the... Uh, uh, direction also. I mean, there is left-handed uh, twist and um, right-handed twist, so it can be plus or 
minus 2. But in this case, let's say it's 2, okay? And there is also the linking number of uh, these alpha and beta curves, right? In this link. I mean, there are two components in this link, and we can define the linking number of this DNA, closed DNA. So there is a formula in DNA topology, and it was given by white and Caligareanu. It says that the linking number of DNA is equal to the twist number plus the right of DNA. Okay? It never changes. It's a topological property of DNA. The linking number is an invariant. It's a topological invariant. What changes? I mean, it can be supercoiled. You can increase the riding. Okay? I mean, uh, the central axis can twist if it is squeezed, for example, in a cell or something like that. But then, to keep the linking number as a fixed number, the twisting will reduce, for example. Okay? So they behave, they act uh, in opposite directions to keep the linking number as an invariant for DNA. Okay, so this was a very quick explanation of what's going on. But, I mean, this is a very well-known formula for uh, people in DNA topology. So linking number is a topological property of the DNA, even though ride and twist may change. 